to on the top, maybe? Yeah, we sent her message. Oh, okay. All right. Ah, look at Hello. everyone. Hello, everyone. Hi, everybody. I'm, I have you guys unmuted at the moment. Um, but what I'm going to do here in just a second is I'm going to remute you. So if you should um, um, need to uh, speak, if you will send a message in the chat for us, and we will try to answer there. Um, what we're going to do is Dr. Ulig is going to start. We see um, Dr. Ng is actually on the um, system, but she may not be at her computer. And then Dr. Ulig is going to share some information around um, P10, P10 in the immune system, information that he knows to date, and what we need to do to take best care of ourselves. And then, and then Dr. Ng is going to chime in. Um, and, and hopefully her, she will be on the system in a moment and she will speak with us as well. Um, I'm going to go ahead and mute everybody. And with that, I will introduce Dr. Ulig and Dr. Ulig, I will let you, um, share just a little bit about yourself and what you do. And we greatly appreciate your time and, and speaking with us today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Christine, for the, um, for the invitation. And I'm um, most grateful to, um, to to speak to to you all, because I uh, I'm a pediatric gastroenterologist, so I see children with um, immune problems and with uh, polyps here in Oxford in um, in the UK, and in uh, in in London, and um, I have been over the last few, few weeks um, on the phone with many many families um, who have rare diseases who have uh, problems uh, with P10 um, and, uh, and other immune uh, problems, immunodeficiencies. And um, the overarching um, worry, of course, is uh, uh, virus. Um, is this true? Uh, Hello, does everyone. Please mute upon entry when you enter the chat virus uh, do to to ask what is the baseline risk as is, is of course sort of already sort of a worry but then in addition of course what does it do if uh, patients um, have a um, weak immune system some immunodeficiency some overreacting immune system in terms of um, some autoimmune diseases what happens uh, if take uh, medication, what happens if patients have uh, tumors and have um, anti-tumor medication that either weakens the immune system or makes the immune system stronger. And um, obviously there are major differences um, with, between adult uh, patients and uh, pediatric patients. So just as a very, very short sort of um, summary um, as you all know, and I think you all follow probably sort of uh, daily sort of the, the news that are quite quite shocking. There is this uh, virus um, that um, started, um, as we think, in November or December um, in in Asia, and then sort of spread uh, throughout um, the um, the world. Um, that has been for quite a while sort of maintained and probably quite well managed in um, in China, but nevertheless sort of spread out um, and it needs very very harsh um, uh, methods to maintain um, the, the virus and of course uh, throughout the world hundreds um, of thousands of uh, people are not only infected but became uh, sick and tens of thousands have um, have died um, throughout the, the world. So what we do know is that the main um, Infectious um, disease is a, is a virus. It spreads relatively um, fast and uh, people become sick usually of uh, pulmonary uh, problem with the, with the lung. There is an 
overarching immune response and uh, some people if they have the disease over over 10 days and with high fever then really get get sick and need um respiratory um support um there it's largely a disease of older uh, people and older starts with um 50, 60, but largely 70 and 80 um, years of, of age. And another uh, risk factor are additional um, diseases, uh, in particular lung uh, diseases, diabetes, and, um, and, and comorbidity in the, in the heart. Males are a bit more uh, affected and have more severe uh, disease. And we are currently, um, I must say, sort of uh, very shocked about the degree of the of the disease. Obviously, in the U.S., you see it every day, sort of what happens in in New York and in other big um, big cities. Um, and on the other hand, um, we are a bit glad that at least sort of um, the children and the youngest ones are much less affected by this um, by this disease nevertheless of course patients uh, and their families are very scared and um, ask about the advice and currently we know for <coughs> diseases like p10 very very little um, what what does what has happened so we can largely give general advice and the general advice re relates to the age and to the risk factors so if there is a patient over 60 years of, of age then the, the risk is, is starting and then sort of um, social distancing trying to avoid any chance for an infection um, should be um, should be should be taken um, there are some countries who have very, very strict rules, in particular here in, um, in, in Europe. Some states in the US have adopted um, to, to this, but not. Uh, uh, my understanding is not, not every um, region has, has done so. But this sort of is probably sort of the most effective way as a population to reduce this risk and to reduce that the healthcare system becomes overwhelmed individually the most important thing is to avoid infection um, and uh, this is by avoiding contacts um, and avoiding larger crowds washing hands trying sort of to have um, um, less uh, risky um, an, an environment and in particular of course if you take medications of anti-tumor um, medication or medications that boost the immune system like checkpoint uh, inhibitors that some of you uh, will um, take and, and experience. Um, so that's, the, that's, that's an overview. Christine, is there anything uh, that you want to, uh, to raise or any specific questions? Um, I know, I think you briefly um, touched on it, but I know we have some patients that are on Everlimus and they wonder um, if that affects them differently being on the Everlimus medication. Um, does that make them any more or any less at risk? And I know there's some studies or school of thought um, which is less understood that perhaps um, it might even be a good thing if they're on this medication. Can you touch on that a little bit? So, Kristen, yeah. it's Karis. Can you hear me? Hi, Karis. Yes, Dr. Eng. Okay. How, Just how, okay. how are you? Good. How are you? Sorry, I struggled to get in, and then I said, let's just use the phone. So, apologies, I am on the phone. No problem. I'm, I'm on my phone as well. Um, okay. So, Dr. Um, Eng. Why don't I ask that question and then home awesome. and jump in? So I've heard everything, seen everything. I just couldn't get in. <laughs> uh, okay. Um, okay. So one of the um, purported, and I said purported treatments for COVID-19 serious disease is in fact mTOR inhibitors, such as a varolimus. 
Um, so of course, as physicians and scientists, we have to say there is no proof in that disease, but um, I, I don't think it's anything to stop. So that's on the one hand. On the other hand, as you know, some people do have um, immune suppression from a viral limits, and if that's true, then one has to say that perhaps that person is um, more susceptible. So I'd love to hear what the immunologist thinks. Yeah, I think it's a double-sided uh, swear that is, uh, that is there. I completely agree with you, uh, Cheris. So there are, two, two, so we do know that um, adult patients with immunosuppression uh, might be more at risk for uh, for, for for having the um, CC virus and other viruses. We know that I think there have been fatal um, outcomes. Uh, also, the risk might be not as big as as feared. But on the other hand, in pediatrics, um, we have some data that people who are under immunosuppressive uh, medication have not become uh, ill, although they have been um, in, in infected. And because part of this um, disease is an overreacting immune system, it might be that indeed in children, uh, it might prevent the, a more severe uh, disease. However, to my knowledge, there is no good data set to suggest that whether the overall net effect is positive or, or negative. What we say to most patients is currently to maintain the medication because uh, some medications are very important and um, if you stop uh, them you might be at higher risk um, than uh, compared with the, with the virus. Absolutely. Um, Dr. Ng, I know a lot of our families have asked questions about what they should do um, to protect themselves. And uh, Dr. Ulick touched on this briefly, but are they any more or any less at risk of contracting COVID-19 um, having simply a P10 mutation? The, the right answer, of course, is that we don't know because there has been no research and no experience, thank God. Um, but for some of you who have reached out to me individually via email, I've been telling people to behave as though um, people with Peter mutation behave as though you have chronic disease. So, so be a little bit more cautious and um, behave as though you could be, in fact, that person with diabetes. And, and just you know, listen and follow the directions of the state and local authorities. So the CDC has guidelines um, and each state is different. So each state in theory should be, um, should be at least as strict as the CDC guidelines, but each state and local authority can be stricter. Um, they shouldn't be less strict because I think that's not a good thing. Um, and so you've heard the guidelines of avoid social gatherings in groups of more than 10 people. Um, social distancing at least six feet. Um, hand washing with soap is the best. Second best alcohol-based hand sanitizers, right? And clean and disinfect frequently touch objects and surfaces. And sometimes you don't think of that doorknob, right? That doorknob to go into the bathroom, public bathroom. I mean, you have to wash your hands before you go and after you go. Um, I know that the CDC is suggesting, not mandating, using face masks. But my pulmonary and critical care physician friends say that it doesn't really help. Use a face mask if you're sick. And by sick, I don't just mean the coughing and all that and having a fever. Usually right before you're sick called the prodrome is when you are the most infectious. And so you're actually wearing a face mask, not necessarily to protect yourself, it's to protect others. Be mindful of materials also um, that either sustain the virus for hours or for days. And so things like cardboard, um, tissue, paper, once the virus is in there and it's dry, it's dehydrated, it's gone. 
express leather is the worst, it can stay there for nine hours or even a couple of days. Um, yeah, I think social distancing and staying at home, sheltering in sight is the key. So then let me give you some real data from the Cleveland Clinic. So we were one of the first in Ohio, in fact, we were the first non-Ohio Department of Health um, lab that the pathology lab tests for COVID-19. So in the beginning, people who have flu-like symptoms were offered this testing. And in the beginning, 20% of all of those, so remember this is early March, 20% um, had influenza A, of course the flu was going around. 3% had COVID-19. After the shelter at home order, there is 0% influenza A. And so this speaks that the shelter at home actually works. Are you all there? Yeah, I'll sorry, can you, okay. can you hear me? Um, yeah. We appreciate that, um, that answer. I have a very interesting question that came from one of our Canadian um, patients and she specifically asked, would a vaccine for COVID-19 affect P10 patients differently? That is when one is developed because of our immune issues or would it be protected as much as the general population? And then the second part of that question, should we keep social distancing measures, all that you just mentioned, um, as long as there's no vaccine available? So I've heard as much as 12 months, um, or if our respective communities say perhaps in May or I don't know, for some June, that that is when we can get back to our normal lives. Can we do that? No. Or should we no, social distance? No, no. No is the short answer. So if we are socially distancing, right, called mitigation, so social distancing, mass, if some of you want that, not gathering in crowds, goes under the term of mitigation. So mitigation works by flattening the curve but pushing the peak out. If mitigation is not used, as in Italy, it's a very, very early peak. So with mitigation in the US, so it's somewhere between mitigation 100% um, who follow it, and you know in the US, that's not true. So let's say there's partial following of the mitigation. The peak of COVID-19 is predicted to be somewhere between mid-May and early June. And that's the peak. It's gonna get worse before it gets better. There'll be more cases, there'll be more deaths, I'm afraid. Um, I would say usually six weeks or more after the peak is probably when it's the all clear. Most public health people will say they want to see 14, one for 14 days of no new COVID-19 cases before they sound the all clear. So if you're in doubt, socially distance, um, and, and use common sense is what I always say. I could add on to this first question um, on the on the vaccine um, part. Um, so the, the vaccine is of course a big hope um, that uh, would be there and there are two types of, of vaccines. So one is called passive vaccine and the other one is an active uh, vaccine. So for the future, I think uh, the aim would be to have an active vaccine, so something that um, mimics the virus and then the patients or a person's immune system is responding, building antibodies, and these antibodies will then protect from future uh, in infections. And a lot of companies, a lot of research groups work on this. It's not a very simple uh, thing. Um, it can be obtained, but it's probably very, very heavily sort of um, researched uh, open. Um, 
And for the vast majority of patients with P10, we would not expect that the immune response will be any different to the um, immune response uh, to um, any other um, healthy person without a uh, P10 uh, mutation. There might be subgroups, a small fraction, where there are low um, lymph, uh, lymphocytes, low immune cells, and low immunoglobulins. And in this subgroup, the immune response might be, uh, might be less. But I think for the vast majority of patients, um, all the studies that we have done, and we have done jointly with, with Jerry's um, and others, uh, would suggest that the immune response is skewed, but still uh, sort of um, sufficient to drive a protective um, response. Um, and that, but that's just a projection. Um, for the passive um, vaccine, I think there are sort of studies ongoing twofold. One uh, that is using um, the plasma of patients who have recovered. And for some regions, some hospitals have some encouraging data that for the worst affected, those who are really in intensive care who need um, um, respiratory um, support, this immune response in the plasma of somebody who has been uh, undergone an infection, who has mounted an immune response could be helpful. And this could suggest that um, a gene technology produced um, uh, serum that contains the anti-coronavirus uh, uh, antibodies could be helpful as a safer and more applicable uh, solution. And I'm pretty sure this would probably be the next step um, that is coming before the active um, vaccine. And there has been quite a bit of progress because these coronavirus infections have happened before. There were outbreaks that were called SARS and MERS. Um, and people have researched in these instances, and it seems that some of the immune responses and some of the antibodies that have been generated in these previous outbreaks from in, uh, independent viruses, they seem to be cross-reactive. And so there is a hope that by learning from these previous um, outbreaks and a uh, passive vaccine could be produced. But it's two ways, it's active and passive and both might be helpful, but on a big population site, it will be this ac active vaccination that uh, holds the most hope. Dr. Ng, did you wanna add anything to that? Uh, the comments from Dr. Ulig? No, I think that's absolutely right. And, and it's not new, you know, drawing plasma from patients who have convalesced from viruses, I mean, through the ages. This is what you, you give um, to people who are dreadfully sick where there's no medication yet. And I say yet because there are many clinical trials ongoing and, and no active vaccination yet. And the reason why you hear the nine months to a year is that it has got to go through the trials and then it has to go through FDA approval. I got it. Um, Dr. Ng, I just had a question from one of our patients who said, when is it safe for us to come back to uh, Cleveland for our regular doctor visits? Yes, yeah, so right now our institution is suggesting July 15th. And I know that we've told some of our patients it could be as early as June 15th, but we've also been hedging to say, please, can you be um, flexible? Um, and of course, it depends when that peak is. When the peak occurs, I think will be much more accurate. So again, um, mid-July is assuming that the peak is in um, mid-May. Okay, fantastic. Are you at the Cleveland Clinic or Dr. Ulig for you in um, the UK? Are you doing online visits or video visits with patients who have a need to try to keep that continuity of care? Dr. Ng, I'll let you go first. Oh yes, no, we are, but here's the problem. I am only licensed in Ohio and Massachusetts. And so there was an Ohio person um, probably this Thursday where we are going to do 
um, a televisit, telegenetics, and we have used telegenetics for a long time, since 2013, but it's that licensing. Now, you would think in a crisis like that, that the governors would waive it. So some states are beginning to waive this. So I understand that Indiana has waived it. So if someone's in Indiana, I certainly could call in. But but then, of course, um, so our P10 team also are very happy to see people via, via telehealth portal. And you can imagine that dermatology actually works very well. It's probably even better than seeing on site because there's light and there's magnification. Um, but but you can imagine that you're here to see Dr. Burke um, for your routine colonoscopy. And unfortunately, that cannot be done virtually. I mean, I, I wish it could because then then the prep doesn't exist. Right. Um, Dr. Ng, I don't know if you can see, we're, we're getting a few good questions and Please just give us a, a heads up when you when you have to get off for you, Dr. Ulick, as well. One question from one of our patients, is it thought that the passive route would be preventative as well or only after infection? We might need clarification on that, maybe, unless you understand the, the point there, Dr. Ng. No, I think let the immunology expert speak to that one. Okay. Home, you're on. Uh, the, the passive route, um, in, in theory, I mean, this has not been, been proven. This sort of, we only can sort of uh, make assumptions from previous uh, views and previous uh, viruses. And the half-life um, is about, um, four or five uh, weeks. So for a short term, it can offer some protection. This is what nature does. Every uh, baby gets uh, some uh, antibodies from um, its, its mom via the umbilical cord. And then we do know that this offers protection for four to up to 12 uh, weeks when it's, uh, when it's gone. So if there is some passive uh, vaccination, it could potentially for a few weeks sort of offer uh, protection, but it will uh, not be uh, cheap. It will not be the general route uh, to, uh, to, to go, and it's not yet approved. So nobody would give plasma just as a prevention in the, in the moment. It's really sort of reserved for the ones who are most severely um, affected. Because obviously with current approaches, with plasma, there is a certain infection risk um, as, as well. It's never zero. There is a certain risk for adverse responses, for allergic responses. And until we have sort of a proven FDA approved, clinical trial approved uh, um, active or passive vaccine, uh, it will take uh, months or even uh, even even years. So this is all just in the trial um, setting. Okay, we have another um, question, which is a really good one, and I think you briefly touched on this earlier, Dr. Ulig, and she says, "I have a child who has gotten ill from vaccines which were live: chickenpox, meningitis. His IgA levels are extremely low." which I think we find that with quite a few of our patients. Would a vaccine, a potential vaccine, I think she's asking, be safe for him? Or only, I, I imagine she's asking if it's not a live vaccine. Yeah, and this is exactly the, um, the, the point. So if the immune response is low, then having non-life uh, vaccines um, would be the recommended uh, way. And this, of course, for coronaviruses, purely um, um, speculation, because there is no vaccine, neither an active nor an, uh, or life and or, or non-life, nor there is an improved uh, um, passive one, one yet. So, so, so yes, uh, if there is a confirmed immunodeficiency or previous vaccine responses to uh, live uh, vaccines, one would recommend to have a non-live uh, vaccination. Okay, thank you. 
Um, Dr. Eng, I believe this would be a question for you. What would be the suggestion for going to get labs or other options? For example, following up on slightly abnormal thyroid at this point in time. Um, would you hold on that or would you try to do, do that with a particular lab that has safe practices? Dr. Ang, are you there? Sorry, I muted myself. Oh, no. <laughs> um, <laughs> all labs will say they're safe practices naturally, but what you don't want to do is to sit in this large waiting room, waiting with everyone else, waiting to get your blood drawn. So if it's just slightly abnormal and it's a matter of waiting three more months, which I think, <laughs> knock on wood, it should be all over by then, um, I think it's okay to wait. Um, if you can go into a lab where there is no waiting, you're just in and out, then that, that's what you want. And the other thing I should say is that it's not been shared publicly, and of course I know why, but you actually have to be within four feet of an infected person for 20 minutes or more to have an infection. For, so just passing someone COVID-19 does not do it. Well, that's encouraging. I think a lot of us are scared um, because we heard you can have a conversation and actually pass the vi virus. But what I'm hearing you say is you need to be in close contact or, or close proximity with that person to actually catch the virus. Is, am yeah, I hearing you correctly? That's why, yep. That's yeah. why it's the six feet, because just to be very cautious, so you have to be less than six feet for more than 20 minutes. And the reason why they're not saying a lot of that is because when people speak and you're close, they spit at you, right? Because you're spitting when you're talking and it's the spit. It, it's not the, you know, you're passing each other like two ships in the night and just waving and saying, hello, you are not going to catch COVID-19 or anything else like that. Okay, thank you. Um, I have another question here, which is a good one. Um, our daughter is on weekly his intra immunoglobin treatment, should we expect antibodies to become present in the near future? Maybe Dr. Ulick? Can you all? So it's IVIG treatment, I believe. And she's asking, the mom is asking about antibodies via this treatment, additional I'm, antibodies. Well, yeah, no, it's, I, I just sort of, so the, the answer is potentially yes. So potentially yes, uh, because um, at some stage, of course, because it's in, um, so these are pooled um, immunoglobulins, um, at some stage, there um, there will be antibodies uh, that will be transferred. So it's an excellent question. However, this process um, takes um, a, a while, and um, I don't think um, currently there will be sort of um, uh, there will be much production um, there. So I think everybody would be extremely keen in not having, of course, sort of. Um, donors uh, who might have the, the disease, although the risk seems to be incredibly uh, low and replicating viruses have not been uh, found in the, um, in the blood. Um, however, um, of course, everybody is just anxious that there could be sort of some, some contamination. On the long run, of course, there will be antibodies, and these antibodies will go into these uh, collections, uh, but this is probably sort of half a year um, ahead. Thank you. Um, here's another good question. Are the immune system issues for P10 patients limited to patients on trials of new drugs or general issues overall? And I'm gonna let you talk about this, Dr. Ulig. I wasn't aware, if so, and my concern this aspect might be falling between the cracks for us. My 11-year-old son has a P10 mutation treated in the UK at GOSH by general surgery. 
lipomas, um, gastro issues, uh, and other thyroid surveillance. So this this um, question is kind of coming back to the point: Do P10 patients have immune issues, or is it strictly limited to those on immune reducing um, drugs? So. If you, I mean, if you are seen in, in Great Ormond Street uh, Hospital, then we could offer you to, um, that, that you could come jointly when you come to your next appointment to our uh, gastro and immune uh, clinic as well. I have a clinic uh, jointly there um, and we could surely arrange uh, that you are seen that you don't have to come uh, twice. Um, so what we currently think is that patients with P10 as a group have an um, have a measurable effect on their immune system in uh, in the ways that they have a reduced number of um, um, of white blood cells that are called uh, lymphocytes and that are important for the for the immune system. There is a change in their distribution of the of the cells, but it's only a very tiny fraction. And I think it might be a percent or two percent or three percent who really sort of have an, um, a significant immune uh, issue that they have very severe infections, repeat infections, invasive uh, infections. For the majority, this measurable, what we call significant uh, reduction in their immune response is uh, probably still sufficient to mount a protective immune response. And on the converse, because in the immune system there is a simple uh, double-edged sword, it's not just an immune deficiency. Immunodeficiency can drive autoimmune processes and these can contribute to um, P10 related problems um, as well. So I think there is an uh, increased immune response, and some patients have some autoimmune uh, response um, as well. And um, everything we know so far, but the data are sort of not sufficient to make sort of an, 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 an final decision is that the ones with autoimmune responses do not have over responding immune system to viruses um, as well. So I think if you have less of immune responses and immune deficiency, this very small fraction might really be in, at risk for, um, for in infections. But the ones who have autoimmune problems, and this can be thyroiditis, can be diabetes, can be celiac uh, disease, or even uh, gut uh, problems, probably still mount a normal response to um, bacteria and to viruses. I, I would second that. I would agree with that. Um, may I just maybe ask a question, make a couple of comments, sort of in general. So in general, and those of you who are my patients have heard me say that probably over and over again. So in general, an 11-year-old with lipomas, unless the lipomas um, uh, threatening a vital organ or it's causing severe pain. Usually I tell my patients, leave it alone because once it's removed, it will come back with vengeance and you don't want to go down that slippery slope. The second thing that, again, I tell everyone in general, and it's been published, is that unless an 11-year-old has GI symptoms bleeding from below or, or just, you know, abdominal pain that you do a CAT scan and you don't see anything, um, does not need pill endoscopy, does not need colonoscopy um, until much later. So this is where, uh, yes, we want to surveillance our patients appropriately. We don't want to over-medicalize them. Uh, absolutely. And I think this, uh, I just felt sort of this was sort of, um, I fully agree with 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 Charis, um, and but this is very difficult for the individual patient to discuss uh, here at the um, at the at the phone. Uh, but um, it's a, it's a balance of being cautious and not to over medicalize, uh, of course. Absolutely, 
and this is why we have um, care guidelines. And Dr. Ng, I think it's okay to say, correct me if I'm wrong, that you're helping lead an initiative to try to have um, academically agreed upon care guidelines worldwide so that we can make sure that our patients get um, proper care, not too much, not too little, uh, exactly yeah. to your point. So, exactly and, and, right. Uh, and look for, look for that for everybody on the, on the call in the, in the future when we get through this um, pandemic crisis. We only have a couple minutes. So um, Dr. Ng, I, I have a patient and this would be for a offline uh, discussion, but she's very worried her daughter's ANA titers, um, she's saying they're, it's homogenous and she was referred to a rheumatologist, the only pediatric rheumatologist in the New Orleans area. And I know that you've heard what's going on in New Orleans right now. Oh yeah. Yeah. Um, she wanted to know, and I can connect with you offline, if there is a physician who can see them via video chat from the Cleveland area to discuss this further, because she's very worried okay. about her child. Okay. So I will, yep. for, for that mom, I will get you connected. And here's, we'll take maybe just a couple more questions, if that's okay, and then we'll we'll wrap up. Um, a um, mom, Kristen, would you yeah. would you like me? So I think what Home was saying just now is that um, we cannot practice individual medicine here, and I'm not, uh, and neither is he. And what what we are talking about is either in the public domain or things that are in the guidelines and what is published, like with my poems and the GI. I mean, it's it's been published. Um, and so now, um, would you like to hear published research? from one of my faculty members, Dr. Sang Ching. What he does is he uses uh, big data and all the things that are known about COVID-19 or coronaviruses like SARS and MERS that you heard about. And he looks for drugs that are FDA approved that can be repurposed. Would you like to hear a little bit about that? Absolutely, yes. Okay, so Dr. Cheng has done all that, and there is a whole list of drugs, all of which are not over the counter except for one, and that is called melatonin. And people take melatonin for their sleep. So let me share with you the mechanism, and Holm can certainly jump in because obviously he's an immunologist. So people believe, not believe, people know that the um, COVID-19 virus binds to TMRSS, so another protein, and then it, um, via its spike, so the virus has a spike protein called S protein that binds another protein called TMRSS, and the two together, so the two have to be together to bind our own, the human being's ACE receptor. So ACE, ACE, angiotensin converting enzyme, is relevant to the control of blood pressure. So it is believed that our own receptors are the ones that facilitate the entry of the virus into us and in, through the blood vessels, and that's how they make us sick. What does melatonin do? So melatonin raises ACE levels, ACE2 levels. And when ACE2 is, is combined with its own receptor, it blocks the binding of the virus. So in a sense, is this a prophylactic? So now I'm making an extrapolation. So I'll share with you what's published. Um, I've given you an extrapolation. So let me then tell you a few facts. And these are scientific facts that have been published. It's in the public domain. Um, elderly people have a decreasing ACE2 expression levels. And it is believed that it is because of decreasing melatonin. So we all know that as people grow old, older adults, I don't need sleep. I can't sleep, and so on. This is consistent with the observation, and you heard it from home earlier, that older adults will have, are at high risk of the virus and a high risk of death. Whereas young children um, over the age of one have extremely high melatonin. They sleep easily, they sleep a lot. And so their ACE2 levels are higher, and um, one school of thought believes that this is how 
kids escape from severe infection. Kids under the age of one, of course, don't quite have an immune system yet, and that's why the deaths in infants are always under one. Melatonin is over the counter. In general, there are no side effects. Um, and so I thought I'd share that. Um, thank you. I think everybody caught that on, online. So melatonin is not a bad thing um, as long as you follow the instructions on the label. Correct, Dr. Right. Ng? For, Correct. For a, and always start low. Start on the lower side. So thank you. That's incredible. Um, well, we are at the 11 o'clock um, central time. So we probably need a, to um, wrap up. There's just one question regarding the melatonin and then we will um, stop there. And we really appreciate both you and Dr. Ang and Dr. Ulig for taking your time for our community. It's very much appreciated. Um, Dr. Ang, one of our um, folks said that melatonin gives them nightmares. Do you recommend a way around this at all? No, so I, so here's someone, I mean, so Samantha, you shouldn't be taking melatonin, I guess. So people that have known side effects already should not take melatonin. So melatonin increases ACE2 levels, so good thing, it doesn't decrease. Okay, and here's one more really good question, and then I'll let you and Dr. Uh, Ulick say closing words, if you would. Last question for now. Uh, children with ADHD and autism who have difficulty sleeping, melatonin is used to help them sleep. Does this mean that they have lower ACE2 levels? Good question. The other way around. It has, no, it induces high ACE2 levels, and it's a good thing. Okay, awesome. But did you want to say, um, Dr. Ulig and Dr. Ng, a few closing words, um, and then we will we'll wrap it up for today? The only closing words is to um, wish you and your your families all the all the all the best, uh, because I know it's uh, really challenging uh, times, and um, it's. Um, challenging for, for you so of to change uh, life life routine in particular if there are underlying um, con conditions so um, no just to stay uh, to stay well and wish you all the best thank you and you and your family as well um, and dr. Ng yes hang in there the whole world is indeed in it together follow the guidelines from your respective departments of health, and, and this too will pass. I mean, for those in the UK, you have heard the Queen's speech. It's only three minutes. Um, for those who are not in the UK, even though she's addressing the UK, I think Google search it. I think it's a very, it's a lovely three, three minute speech, very inspirational. Awesome. Thank you. Well, we greatly appreciate you guys. And for everyone else, Andrea and I are keeping you all in our prayers. And we will continue to share information as we get it. And just um, thank you. And everybody take care. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Thank you all in the late summer. Bye-bye. Uh, <laughs> Bye. Bye, Christine. Bye, Andrea.